Thank you everyone for coming to my presentation today on stress. I'm very excited to be here with all of you because stress is actually a topic that I've spent a lot of time working on. I'm a marriage and family therapist and I'm in private practice and actually my um, specialty has scarier words in it like developmental trauma, um, accumulated stress and uh, anxiety are the three specialty areas that I have. But I work for um, an agency called CHAC as well, and we have a grant from First Five and a family resource center, actually four family resource centers in Mountain View, Cupertino, and Sunnyvale. So I have information about that should you have um, any reason to come up into the area and explore some of the programs there. And you know, when you give a stress presentation, it's really important not to stress people out. <laughs> like, how can we find ways to, uh, to make it enjoyable? And uh, the thing that I love about the way that I approach stress is um, that it's so universal. There's no kind of judgment in it, because we're all in the same soup, especially living in an area like Silicon Valley that's just you know so packed with a lot of vibrant and creative energy, and at the same time, a lot of pressure to do more and from, from lots of different areas of life to do more. And um, so what I believe is that the antidote to stress is <coughs> play. Mm -hmm. And unplug and play, two of the really key things. I would also say rest would be a good one downtown. The play. And the, the kind of ironic part about it is that when you're really stressed out, it's like play almost feels like work. And so the, I think that some of the concepts that I'm going to tell you about today are part of a practice that you could develop. It's like, wow, we have to actually practice being relaxed. But it's kind of true. When you get into that groove of all of the doing that we do, um, learning how to come down, especially because the stress that most of us uh, get ourselves into is really rewarded and reinforced in the culture and in the environment. Like, ooh, you, you pulled an all-nighter doing that. You know, good for you. And you're really motivated. <laughs> so um, here are some of the topics that we'll talk about today. I don't, has anybody heard of somatic experiencing? Okay, so this will be something new for you, but it was developed by Peter Levine um, to talk about how the nervous system um, organizes itself when there's stressful events. It's not that different, actually, it's pretty similar to things that happen in trauma. So, we're borrowing from the same kind of idea. We're going to talk about simple changes that you can make to improve life in your family or in the families that you're working with, for those of you who are teaching and um, tools that you can use to manage stress and teach to your children or your students. So if we think about our bandwidth, so, you know, we have our day-to-day -day chores that we have to do, we have family and personal needs, our job, and, you know, there's a certain point, like, okay, I can handle that bandwidth, that's okay, and then we keep, you know, got extra demands that come up, and, oh, got to you know, jump in the car and go get this or do that. And before you know it, you kind of hit the end of your bandwidth. And we replenish the bandwidth every day with sleep and rest and play. Hopefully there's play somewhere in your day. Um, with support of the people who love us. And, of course, with food. So those are some of the basic ways that we get reconnected. And I'll talk about some of the other ones that probably you're already doing, like you know, working out and those kinds of things would be included. Um, other band with bandits <laughs> are gonna include uh, media. And it's kind of ironic because um, in an earlier lifetime, I worked in advertising. And, <laughs> and after I worked in advertising, I took a psychology class at De Anza and they had this little presentation about this, um, this psychologist early in the days that figured out, so he, he did something really unethical in the psychology world, which is he created a fear in a child and then didn't uncreate the fear. Have you heard of the Little Albert story mm -hmm. with the rabbit? Yeah. So I'll tell you the story. 
um, Jobby Watson <laughs> decided to, to he, there, I guess there was somebody, a lady working there who would bring her baby. And so what he did was he paired a stimulus that the child liked with a fear. So like, ooh, a white rabbit. And every time the child would reach for the white rabbit, he'd make a loud noise and the baby would cry. And he did this repeatedly until the child was terrified of white rabbits. And then later on became afraid of anything white, essentially. And eventually John B. Watson got kicked out of the psychology field because it was unethical to create this fear and then not, you know, help the child recover from the fear of uh, all things white. And uh, where did Mr. Watson land? Nowhere else than advertising. Where he realized that if he could capitalize on the deepest fears of mothers, that take care of their children, then he could sell more things to them. So this is a very purposeful thing. I <laughs> see the size, <laughs> the stress is going up in the room. Um, it's a very purposeful thing in advertising, in activism, even those causes that you're so happy to support that you know reach out to you, they're designed to raise your anxiety to get you to move into action, right? And I would say that it's works a little bit in reverse because when you get to a point where you're overwhelmed, you go more into collapse and helplessness rather than into action. And I think that's kind of uh, problematic. So if you go on a media diet, your anxiety will likely go down right away. So no more articles, no more Facebook, just taking a complete break from all of that stuff, you'll probably notice a big difference. We really have information overload, this is what it comes down to. It's like, I remember reading somewhere that like, what we get exposed to in one day is what people a couple hundred years ago were getting exposed to in like a year or a lifetime or something really dramatic in that way. So it's a lot to take in, and we're taking it in about a whole global situation, things that we can't control, right? So we cut some of that out, focus on what is here and now and what is in our control, that helps to reduce our stress. Even the sensory overload, now we're completely bombarded with light and sound and color and 16 things popping up on your computer screen all the time. Right? So as much as you can reduce that, it's, it's really interesting how um, I can have someone in my office and I can dim the lights and see them go, and, and so you might start to notice these little things about yourselves. And even if you're working in a classroom, some of you probably have experimented with not having fluorescence on and those sorts of things. <clears throat> also, it's the overscheduling. Um, I have a client who's a, a mother's helper, and she was counting up that she was driving two hours a day to have, I think it's three children, that she's shepherding to events and to and from school and activities. And all of the scheduling that we end up doing that just seems like it's getting more and more. <clears throat> the good news is that when we're inside our bandwidth, we might notice that we feel more curious about the world. We're more embodied, we're more present. It's like all of the things that we say we want in the world. We want to be able to connect to our loved ones in a more present way. It's like Maybe you'll remember a time recently, or if you were on vacation, and you had several days of space. And maybe for the first few days you were kind of in that, let's hurry up and do something kind of mode, and then you notice that it sort of settles, and, and you're kind of just breathing the whole experience in. You're like, wow, this is where it's at. That was you and your bandwidth. I know for me, when I get stressed out, I'm not really that curious about anything. It's like, I just don't even care. Right? I don't want to learn anything new, really. You know, it's like just enough to survive and keep on going with whatever we put ourselves, you know, put on our plates or that are on our plates. Um, and, and so when we're in our bandwidth, you know, our relationships will improve. Our partners are more likely to be supportive and connected. Children are more likely to be calm and be able to self-regulate cooperative, they do better in school, and our health improves. And you know, if we, if we had a magical pill that said, do all, you just take this magic pill and you'll be able to have all these things, we'd all be up in line. No side effects? Okay, really. Um, 
And so there is a way to that, but it really requires a dramatic look at how much we're taking on, how much we're considering is mandatory, and where there might be some flexibility to start trimming back on our day-to-day -day workloads. <clears throat> and most of us are actually rarely, if ever, inside the bandwidth. And inside the bandwidth is where recovery happens. That's where the integration happens for children to learn, right? And most of us are kind of like living on borrowed bandwidth. Like we're trying to catch up on sleep, but this weekend I swear I'm going to stay in and I'm just going to sleep. But, you know, and what kind of life is that? <laughs> just like getting through the week just only to come to the weekend and, and try to recover from it. So maybe you guys have figured out other ways, but um, I hear that a lot. And, you know, quite honestly, it's not such a bad thing if it really is a short time. But doesn't it seem like you go, okay, well, I'm just going to work this hard until I get to, you know, that presentation that I have to do or that thing, and then everything's going to calm down. <laughs> Sounds like famous last words. Like. So if you take the bandwidth idea and you put it between these two lines now, we start to look at the nervous system. And the nervous system has the sympathetic side, which is the, I need to get up and get moving and do stuff. So it could just be, oh, the kids are up and they need their breakfast. All right, I'm getting out of bed, and I get that energy going. Kids got breakfast, they're all happy. Oh, okay, now I can relax. That's a, that's a cycle of activation and then settling, right? It could be something more dramatic. Ah, there's a bear, ah, right? So it, it just depends on what the need is. And if you're requiring more energy than what's available within that bandwidth, and you go out of the lines, then what you're going to notice is that there will be symptoms and there will be coping strategies that have to happen in order to support you getting through that. And if that's a temporary thing, that's fine. You know, like you get crazy wrapped up in something, you settle, and then you go back into the flow. But unfortunately, it usually looks a little more like that, where people are constantly on the red line and the blue line is almost never happening. <clears throat> so management strategies are things like that I tell myself, we'll just get through this, you know, we, we bolster ourselves, which is a healthy coping strategy. Um, sometimes we'll go a little less healthy, which would be, you know, maybe snapping at people or getting grouchy. Um, Sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to remember that meditation class I took, and I'm going to take my two, three deep breaths or, you know, whatever kind of thing. Otherwise, it could be binging or addictions, other things like that. So it's kind of a continuum from the, the more adaptive to the less adaptive. Um, then we go on to the symptom side, and that's when we start getting complaints about headache and um, problems in the digestion. You know, everybody, I, I don't know if I've ever met anybody who doesn't complain about muscle tension. <laughs> and maybe some of that is ergonomics, but I, I taught yoga for 12 or 13 years, and it's, it's almost never. Of course, you know, they are coming to me, so <laughs> take that into account. Um, fatigue is such an issue. I, I almost don't meet anybody who doesn't complain that they're tired, too. Um, anxiety, depression, I mean, it's really, again, on a spectrum of, you know, minor things that you can work with, all the way to things where, like, the world is collapsing because you can no longer keep it going. So if you think about, if you have a motor, you're in your car, and you have the gas pedal all the way down, and you have the brake pedal all the way down, all right, you can do that for a minute or two, but I don't know if you want your engine to do that for very long. So we want to go into the what can we do portion of this so that we don't get too overwhelmed with that, all of the challenging parts of it. But um, I really think that to make a, a really strong change, it requires a, almost a value shift in the whole family. And sometimes it's going to feel like that's not possible. And it might feel like, all right, we can do this, but it's going to be a longer term project. It's like, fair enough. Like, what can, what can the family sustain? There are certain obligations, responsibilities, um, mortgages, 
and things that maybe have to be attended to? What are the things that we can change in the day-to-day -day that might make things a little bit more spacious for us as a family? And we're going to talk about um, a lot of those. One is just reducing the amount of online time in the evenings at home. Um, I think that boredom is, is highly underrated um, because when you're bored, like you'll, you'll sit and wait with the boredom and then you might actually get an impulse to do something. And it's that impulse that is sort of that like stream of consciousness like, oh, I think I'm going to play with something or, you know, I think I'm going to go take a walk or, or those kinds of spontaneous here and now experiences that are helpful. Again, the media diet it's a big one. Um, and timeouts from tech, I really love the airplane mode because I know that no one can reach me, so I don't have to be worried of tending to or any of that. And um, I'll take you know time on a weekend where I'll just put it on airplane mode during the day. Uh, every single night at a certain hour, it's on airplane mode. And, and it does give me a little bit of sense of relief. And it's an ongoing process up here too, but it's, uh, it's a worthwhile one. Shared downtime is a really interesting concept. Um, you might remember back when things were when you were younger and there was no Wi-Fi or internet at home. I remember for me, I got a computer in my home during high school, but it didn't have Wi-Fi or internet, no internet connection at all. And it, it wasn't a thing, you know, so we would sit around together. You'd sit around the kitchen table or you'd sit on the couch and you'd be maybe watching TV, but there'd be more personal interaction. There's actually physiological reasons why connecting to people is important. So um, there's this psychiatrist out of, or he's actually a researcher who originally was in um, University of Chicago, who studied um, the nervous system and these specific parts that relate to us connecting. And what he found was that when we connect with another person, like very early in life, most of us learn how to sense whether or not I'm safe with this person. Like I look at you and I go, oh. Or if I look at you and go, oh, friend, you know? And when we have that, our system will usually settle if we're with friends. Like, okay, I'm good. That doesn't happen with a computer screen. And it doesn't get built as well when there's a lot of screen time. Now, our eyes were not really designed to look in one place for a long time. And part of the structures that I'm talking about include orienting to the environment, turning the head, looking with the eyes, and those sorts of things. So just to give you a little bit more backup for the unplug idea, and I know that people are recommending maybe an hour of screen time a day for young children, and that would definitely be a good maximum to hold for that very reason so that people learn how to connect and engage with other people. Let's see what else is on here. Letting yourself be bored, listening for what your impulse is. It's really funny because when I first went into my training of somatic experiencing, which is this trauma resolution um, thing, I, I got there on the first day, I sat right in the front row with my notebook, and I was scribbling down everything I could. And the teacher looked out and he said, if I look out at you and I notice that you're kind of drifting, you're kind of like dropping and going to sleep, I'm going to look at you and say, ah, that person really wants to learn some math experiencing. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? <laughs> and he actually set up in the back of the room all these mattresses and sleeping bags and pillows where people can go and just rest. Go rest and then you come back. Because his idea is that once, you're, once your bandwidth is full, you're not going to take anything in anyway. So you go and rest your brain, it integrates a little bit, you come back, and then you actually have more room to engage. And it's such a radical concept, especially um, you know, when you get into teaching environments in, in elementary school and such, where they have such pressure to get through material. It's like, no way, I can't let the children you know, do anything like that. Um, another thing that's really helpful is going outside. Um, it's only been in the last couple hundred years that we've been inside with electric lights. I remember seeing that as a theme in Downton Abbey. I didn't watch that series, but I imagine some of you did. Rose. But I remember the, the grandmother or something who was very opposed to having electric lights. 
And she was kind of on to something. Because then we were more in the rhythm with light and dark. And we just went to bed when it was dark. And we got up when it's light. And you think about all that time at night that you would have, like, oh, oh I guess I'm sleeping. Or you know, they would wake up for, for bits of time and go back to sleep. But getting into the rhythm of nature, being outside, looking at the birds, and just being with it. And I think in this way, our kids and our pets are our best teachers for this. Because they haven't learned to not pay attention to the environment yet. And they're just like, they want to see it all, and they want to go and touch it, and, you know, what is it made of, what does it do, you know? And if we just let ourselves follow them, we can relearn it. And when you do that, you're probably going to notice that things get a little more relaxed. So part of the concept that I'm hoping to give to you is that when you can start to detect physiological signs in yourself of stress increasing or decreasing, that's a really helpful way of managing it. So the, the most popular paradigm out in the world right now for stress management <laughs> is cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are some really useful concepts in that, and it's a very top, uh, upper brain kind of strategy around managing stress. But what it forgets is that this is a brainstem process. Like when I get stressed, I'm getting a little hot and flush, my heart might start to pound, my breath is going to change, and you can't really separate out the two. You know, like if something stressful happens and you're having a panic attack, you can tell yourself all day long, okay, I'm going to stop that thought. You might have some success, but the more stress is coming out from the systems in the brainstem, the less success you're going to have at being able to jump off that track and get into the cognitive brain. It kind of cuts off. I think there was a study that um, when you're very activated with a lot of stress, your IQ goes down 20 points. <laughs> I have no idea how they measured that, it's, uh, but it's a good number. <laughs> you, you think about like times when you've gotten mad at your partner or something, it's like, ooh. <laughs> All right. So, when you start to be able to recognize these things for yourself, like, oh, okay, you know, I notice when I start to feel my shoulders get chronically tight, it might be my sign to slow down. And so that's really the first process, is like figuring out what are those things that I notice that I never really noticed were there, that they're there. And then, now what do I do with them? Right? It's like, okay, well, I notice them. Can I slow down? Can I take a rest and come back to this? And uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, a process and a, and a learning thing. It's about curiosity with it. <clears throat> um, resting when tired is really hard because we tend to override our internal cues. My internal cue says I'm hungry, so I'm going to go eat. Well. I don't know about you, but from my experience, a lot of people don't even recognize when they're hungry. They might get a headache, they might get a little dizzy. Most people don't necessarily feel it as like hunger pains. So quite a few people don't. Um, a lot of people like they'll get so tired, but they'll just keep going anyway, and then the next batch of cortisol will come through, and people will get a second wind. And so what I'm saying is like, what if? There were certain times, obviously there are appropriate times, like I'm tired of a rest. But, you know, every now and then if you say, you know what, wow, I've been doing dishes for half an hour, I'm getting a little bit kind of tired. What if I just sat on the couch for a few minutes and, and not grab my phone and fill with the phone? I'm going to get bored, right? Oh, I'm going to get bored. Let me see what happens if I get bored. <laughs> All right. Um, and so to, to start to notice when you're pushing, it's like, oh, if I just answer that one more email, or if I do this one thing, and, and, and see, like, wow, if I didn't do that email, if I did it tomorrow, what would really happen? Okay, you know, it's many more things I think can be pushed back than we allow ourselves to believe. The next step in it is going to be when you get the practice of doing it yourself, then you start to notice it in children. And in a way, it's almost easier to notice it in someone else than in you. And that's why you know, I really 
like the fact that when you have partners or good friends or good coworkers, you can be like, hey, you just go ahead and take a little break. And I'm gonna, I'll take that part over for you and you know, we'll go on. You know, it's like a, a good trade-off of bandwidth, right? Let's let you catch up and, and I'll take over. And, um, and it's a you know, similar thing with children. It's like, okay, um, if, you, if you think about like, all right, the child has the meltdown. What was happening before that? Well, I could see that they were getting a little bit more in their movements. I could see some frustration building up. And what was happening before that? Right? And sometimes there will be a thing. Sometimes it just feels like it came out of nowhere. But then you might go, when's the last time they ate? You know, so if you start to track backwards <coughs> from what was happening, then for the future you might go, okay, I'm going to look for that sign next time. And then let's see if we can, you know, help meet the need or redirect before the blow-up comes. Sometimes that's helpful. And also to help them notice, wow, I noticed you're getting a little frustrated there. Is there something I could do to help? Okay, well, you keep doing it then, <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> but just helping them notice as well. I did take that picture. <laughs> um, so, I want to do an experiment with you so you can get a little sense of your nervous system right now. And uh, what if you imagine yourself right on that very beach, this Maui, and um, if you have a special spot for yourself, you can also picture that. And you might want to close your eyes or you might want to look at that. Whatever makes you feel comfortable. Let's see if you can take a moment and really feel yourself in the chair. And you feel your feet are on the ground. And the next thing that might happen is you'll notice the parts aren't that comfortable. These chairs are never 100% comfortable for me. You might notice that and then see if you can adjust and help yourself settle. <coughs> And if you take a little bit of a scan to notice how things are in this moment, are things more on the tense stress side? Are they more on the relaxed, rest and digest thing? And then once together, pick either this image or another image that you like. And just see if you can imagine yourself in a place surrounded with beauty. And there is nowhere to go and nothing to do. And you feel the breeze on your skin. It's warm but not hot. And maybe you hear the sounds of the wind and the water. And if you get this image and start feeling like it's connecting, see if you start to feel a little bit more relaxed. And as you relax, is there a place in particular that you notice being more relaxed? Something soften. Something got easier with the breath. Notice if your attention is getting drawn away by other sounds. And then if possible, coming back to your own experience in your body. And if there's anything pleasant that you notice in your body at all, See if you can bring your attention there as if you're trying to really cultivate and encourage that experience. feel ready, let's go ahead and just let your attention come back to the room. And you might notice that you wanted to keep your eyes closed just a little longer. 
if that was the case, I hope you gave yourself that permission so you felt ready to open your eyes. So I'm curious, did anybody feel more relaxed? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people nowadays are taking meditation classes, they're taking yoga. Um, one of the things that they don't emphasize as much is noticing how you know you're getting more relaxed. I mean, I think people are much more familiar with how you notice you're getting stressed, right? That's, that's usually where the dialogue is. But when you start to notice things getting a little better, it's like when you have a headache and you, you take your, your aspirin or whatever you're taking, and, and you sort of wait, and where is that point? Oh, oh, it just got a little easier. And there's actually some signaling in the brain that will help speed up that process once it, it gets acknowledged. Sort of an interesting little trick that you can use. But it's the same with stress. If you think about even a child who's having a meltdown, they're having a hard time, and you're holding space with them, with them, and you're like, oh, okay. You're, you're keeping your own nervous system as calm as you can, being connected, and then if you watch and wait and see like where that little hiccup is or that little breath that they take that might indicate, oh, okay, they're starting to settle. There might be another round, here comes another wave. But um, when you start to track it in this way, um, you might notice it a little bit differently and how to relate with it. It's like, okay, well, he's not done yet. If I stay with him a little longer, it's going to continue to settle, and then he'll probably be even more present than if I interrupted that process and started going on to the next thing. And, of course, you're sometimes going to have to interrupt and move on to the next thing. Does that make any kind of sense? <laughs> So it really is helpful, um, and I always think of children having a superpower of being able to feel their bodies. And one of the things that they feel so much more clearly than we do as adults is their gut. It's like if you watch how a, a, an infant or a really young child, like their belly, they belly breathe differently than we do. Did you ever notice that? If you think back, it's like they're they're just like they'll lead with it. And I know a lot of us in this room. Men and women get the holding your gut languaging, but um, for giving your gut some freedom and also some love and attention, it gives us so much information. There's actually a nine to one ratio. For every one message that your brain sends down to the gut, like, ah, I forgot that I was supposed to take my child to whatever, gut tightens, right? For every one of those, there are nine messages from the gut saying, I don't know about this. Something might be wrong. Oh, actually, things are a little bit. Oh, we're okay now. Are you saying gut like instinct or actual your abdomen? Like, actually, inside the gut, yeah. there's as many brain cells as there are in a cat's brain. I just read that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I didn't even ask her to say that. <laughs> 90% of our serotonin is, is built in the gut. So our, and our gut health and happiness is, is going to be a real helpful piece of the stress component. Yes? So when a, a lot of children, including myself as a teenager, that's where I felt a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very common area to feel the tension. And it's great that you were able to notice that because sometimes that's a place that people will not notice. Yeah? Have you? I'm just asking, so the article I read was about how they're they're starting to treat OCD with probiotics, and they're finding good results because if you have healthy gut flora, then that transmits to your brain, and a lot of kids who are being diagnosed with OCD, they're fixing it. Yeah. So sometimes helping with the gut health and also working with the child's nervous system, um, helping them get more internal self-regulation on board. So I think uh, as teachers, and even as parents interacting with, with school kinds of systems, self-regulation is, can your child can control themselves? You know, if we're in circle time, will they raise their hand and take the turns? All that kind of stuff, right? Um, but for a somatic therapist like myself, it's self-regulation is, when I get hot, do I start to sweat? Right? That's a self-regulation 
kind of process. It's, you know, when, when I get stressed, can my system kick in and help the stress settle back down again? And that is the issue because we get our stress all revved up and it starts to settle. And before it settles, we stress it out again. And so it never really has time to fully settle. And the, the ironic and annoying thing about it is that it actually feels stressful to calm down. Your system's like, I don't think this is a good idea. It's like, this isn't normal. We should be shaking it up again. And so the minute we start to dip into that, well, oh, I need my phone, or maybe I should get back on the computer, or whatever it is, the doing part kicks in. <clears throat> so I think if you remember that one thing and see if you can challenge it, um, you might see what's on the other side of that, right? So, my uh, a friend of mine who's a, a psychologist at the <coughs> Rose Institute and I created an eight-week program to go a little bit deeper into this. It's essentially, what I do with people in therapy to some degree, um, but we work on first the the body, the ourselves like learning our own nervous system, because when you learn it from the inside, it's a lot easier to work with someone outside. Um, then we start to stabilize the adult relationships. So the adults are the container for the children. And if you have that little bit of handoff thing, all right, I'll take over so that you can get a break. OK, now I need a break. Let's you take over. Um, those trade-offs that probably are happening to a lot of degree in, in a lot of people's homes, but making it a little bit more of using activation language. Like, I came, I came home today, traffic was awful, this, that, and the other thing happened at work, I'm at my limit. All right, what do you need? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go into the bedroom for 10 minutes, can you just keep dinner going, <laughs> right? Then after that, we start um, working more overtly with the children, <clears throat> holding the container, just even, you know, four big experiences, because when the big experience happens, if we hold the container for them, then oftentimes we'll see what's on the other side as it begins to settle. And I think if you look at um, meltdowns or you know having a bad day or whatever it is, children will get upset. When they get to that other side, if you start to look at this is a sympathetic nervous system process, oh, there came their parasympathetic, they're coming down now. They needed a little hug, they needed to just talk or cry it out or whatever, and then it got better, right? So helping us notice that is, uh, in that languaging is useful. Um, and then we have modules on communication, sensory overload, kind of thing. Um, and also navigating um, intergenerational issues, because, um, you know, a lot of us, I mean, different generations had different ideas about how to manage things, and if you're coming and you're learning all these great things, but your parents are like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Why are you letting them cry? <laughs> um, that can be a real challenge to navigate and um, in multicultural situations as well, even if um, your culture is uh, you know, different in your home versus out in the general population. <clears throat> so here's one of the, the toolkit things that I use um, in that class. And I talked about cognitive and behavioral therapy, and um, if you have some of that language, it can be really helpful of keeping that observer on board. And there, there's a certain point in which stress gets so high, an observer is not there anymore. We want to avoid that happening. So if you're starting to lose your concept of like, oh, I'm really getting stressed out here, then you're really beyond, and it's helpful to reach out you know, to a trusted level and say, I really need to take a chill. So. Um, being able to keep on board the process aspect. You're having an argument with someone, you know, wait a minute, let me just step back here. Activate it. Okay. Oh, let me just get less activated and then we can have a conversation. Because when you're arguing from activation, it's not going to be as much empathy and compassion. <laughs> the thought stopping is helpful. People with chronic anxiety especially, they'll end up going in loops. On loops. I mean, I go in loops all the time. Like, I gotta get this thing done. Uh, oh my god, that thing! You know, just like this again. You know, and I'm happy that 
most of you in here will understand when I say broken record. <laughs> I taught at Foothill for a long time, and I one day realized that I can't say broken record anymore. <laughs> anyway, um, also balancing the negative thoughts. Like when we're really stressed, all we're going to see is the negative stuff. And so if we can go, you know, oh, 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 awful thing. But at least there was this. And there was that one. Oh. But at least someone's okay mid to help. <laughs> and it's really surprising when clients come in. One of the first things that I ask them after they tell me the horrific thing that they're coming in for, what was the thing that helped? How did you get through that? That's a, like, we're resourceful creatures. What did you do? Right? So remembering that. And in times of stress, will help bring the overall thing down. <clears throat> you also can include the body channel. One of the biggest tips is like when you're having stress about particular content, if you set the content aside and just have your body experience, then it tends to not escalate anymore. And then when it de-escalates, then you can get back into the content and have a little bit more calm on board. So if you picture the exercise that we did with the, the picture from Maui, and um, what we did there was like, all right, first, have, have the image, enjoy it, right? Pleasant image, <laughs> like that one. Um, and then, all right, setting that aside, what do you notice in your body? And then we kind of sat with it for a while. And what will happen is, after a while, it will move into something else. Now, doing that with a, a pleasant image is a lot easier than doing it with that thing that you're struggling with and has a lot of energy with it. But over time, you can start to do that, and especially if you have someone on the outside that'll help. You know? so. The other thing is, if you're starting to notice like getting real activated, or if you're feeling kind of like uh, frozen or stuck, um, sometimes just giving yourself a little bit of like your your body remembers where it is in space. That can sometimes be a helpful thing. Sometimes it's we use this in my practice of just like, oh, okay, I feel the tingling on my skin. Okay. <clears throat> Singing and humming um, is getting into parts of our nerves that um, can help us calm down. Um, anybody like to sing, hum? Yeah, it feels good. Especially when no one's there. <laughs> and they're happy too. <laughs> Um, the other thing to settle, like when things are getting intense, is to change it up. Um, if the, the tips and things aren't on board, like all the things that you've collected your whole life for reducing stress, if you can't access them, then it's like, you know what, I've got to completely change the topic. I'm going to change the channel. I'm going to read a silly book, um, you know, watch sitcom TV, anything that's just not anywhere connected to the trigger. And that can just, you know, get things enough time to settle in your system. <clears throat> and then getting outside help, like turning your attention to the environment. Wow, let me just look out the window. We've got wisteria outside the window. It's like, oh, let me just use that, watch the birds running around trying to build their nests. <laughs> and, and then just notice when things start to get better. Um, mundane chores. I actually, I actually told my client one time to alphabetize her bookshelf. <laughs> she could not keep out of her thoughts. I'm like, get in your bookshelf. But the unfortunate thing is, a lot of us can multitask. I can, I can get in my bookshelf and I can think about that thing that's making me miserable. So, it takes a little bit of work there. And, and talking to a friend is helpful, unless you're just using your friend to go around on that same loop. Like, you know what, let me just find out how my friend is doing. And sometimes if you get into their story, your story will kind of go into the background. And it's a really And then perhaps coming back to it if there's something specific that you want to work with or resolve. I have another uh, couple of breathing exercises, and I put my website on there because I have them guided that you can download and uh, use at any time. They're free. And uh, I'll try one of them with you. Um, the exhalation is where the calming usually happens. Now, if you have a history of knowing that reading exercises don't feel good for you, go ahead and skip it. <laughs> but otherwise, if you'd like to try it, how it works is we take a full breath in, 
and then we exhale all the way out until we feel comfortably empty. Not like, uh, right? <laughs> Just like, all right, I'm kind of done. And then we pause for a moment and wait for the breath to have its impulse to come back in. <clears throat> so we'll do that three times for those of you interested in participating. So we start out by just exhaling all the air out. And then take a nice breath in. And then just let it go all the way out. And everybody will go at their own pace. And when your breath feels empty enough, wait until your body says, I need a new breath. And then take a nice full breath in. Exhale it out. One. So just take a check in with your body, notice how things are. And kind of bookmark how that went, because I'm going to add another little piece. And that is, this is probably the first time you've ever been in this room. And uh, if you let your eyes do whatever they wanted, not worrying about what other people are going to think, or if you're being rude by looking at someone, maybe just let them do what they wanted, what would they do right now? And closing your eyes and going to sleep might be on that list. <laughs> Notice what you get curious about. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So coming back this way. Um, let's start with the first part first. Did people feel more relaxed after that? Was it yeah? okay? Was it challenging for anybody? Or? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's an easy thing you can put in your pocket and do in your grocery store. Right. I, I prefer to do these things uh, like your dental gloss way. Just do it whenever you think of it, rather than Oh, I have to remember to do that when I'm stressed. <laughs> doesn't tend to be as helpful. Um, what about the looking around the room thing? What did you notice with that? Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did it, was it easy to look around, or was it you wanted to kind of just focus on one area? Did it feel challenging? I really want to look at the people, but I just kind of, I felt uncomfortable doing that. Yeah. So I looked at, I looked at the back of their heads. <laughs> nice. Nice hair. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting because as often some of the things that would really support us, we've been conditioned that that's not okay to do. And, and looking at people is definitely one of them. Um, I, I do an exercise with clients where um, they're, they're actually laying on a table, and I just say, I'm going to look this way, and what do you think would happen if you just looked at me? Oh, I can't do that. That's just not right. But I've just given you permission to do that, and it's still hard. So in, in different cultures have different experiences of it, but definitely in my culture, it's like, oh, you shouldn't stare at someone. That's impolite, right? The other one is touch. And there was this interesting um, study or this uh, article that I read about um, touch. Like they, they just went to different countries and they observed people going to a cafe and how many times there was casual contact that happened between the people. <laughs> and I think ours for the US was two. <laughs> uh, in the UK it was zero. <laughs> 
And I think in Brazil it was somewhere around 40 something. Uh, Within one hour. <laughs> sorry, can you, I missed something in my mind, but somewhere else I missed that. So the study was that they went to different countries. Different so countries different. where there were outdoor cafes. <laughs> okay. And they, they just wrote down how many times there was casual contact that happened. And there is a lot of emerging evidence that shows how much we need touch to help us feel connected and safe. And an informal, informal survey, my partner and I were watching, you know, bad old TV, it's like Fantasy Island or something like that. <laughs> and the guy walks up and he's like, hi, so-and-so, wah, 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 wah. And I'm like, oh, we just don't do that anymore. Like, hands to yourself, you know? And in schools, there's children, right? It's, I specialize in touch, so that's why I have a, a lot of passion for it. And I actually work with people with touch. Yeah, and, and I think children even need it more to really ground them. A lot of times, just a, my arm around would just wrap their back, and you can almost feel them. That's right. That's right. And I would say that they still know they need it, and we've forgotten that we need it that much, too. And also their impulse to do that. We, um, several of us are at the same school, and I have a one and a half year old who comes with me to pick up my five year old. And actually, sometime I'll, I'll actually count, but the number of kids who, when they're coming out to go home, they all stop and touch the baby. Like they, and I say they pet her. I mean, they, it's like she's a little dog standing out there, but they all walk by and touch her. And I think it's interesting that they feel that urge, and I would never be like, I'm walking by Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how does the one and a half year old respond to the contact? She, I, I, she doesn't seem to be annoyed by it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Have you guys ever watched like on um, any YouTube videos where like they have the the dog that will come up and just like flop down on the other dog and they're just all like squished in there and it's like they like that kind of contact and you know it's a combination of many factors for why people. Um, come to the conclusion that touch is not safe, but um, cultural conditioning is definitely a big thing. And so, you know, kind of just thinking about that, and, and sometimes it's like, you know, your children reach a certain age, and they, they'll start to distance with the contact um, from their side of things, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, so, I think, yeah, in, in terms of teaching stress management to kids, they're going to learn by watching us. Um, that, that contact that we were just talking about, um, of just, you know, sitting together, there's, um, there's a really nice video that I use in the Stress Busters class that is all these metronomes, you know, like when you had to learn piano. And you know, they have, like, their two pans and a board, and there are six metronomes on it. And one by one, they go, and they're all to the same level of tick-tock that they're going to do. And so they all start off, and they're like this. And then, lo and behold, within a minute, they're all exactly the same. And so the, the person running the video who stops it, stops one, and just starts it randomly. And within another minute, they're all back to being on the same exact thing. And they call that entrainment. That's it used in physics as a concept. Well, it happens in all oscillating systems, all systems that pulsate. Guess what we are? <laughs> We're an oscillating system too. And so um, our systems will actually regulate off of each other. So that's why everybody wants, you know, when an infant comes home, lots of skin-to-skin -skin contact, and, and that, that's really helpful. But, but guess what? Even as we get older, um, that contact is, we're, we're just helping each other get more regulated. What is that called again? Entrainment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look up um, on YouTube, um, metronome entrainment. I'm pretty sure it'll come up. Yes. I think touch stresses some people. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, in part because of what I was just saying, because of the cultural conditioning around it. Do you think it's conditioning from birth, or do you think some of it's just the makeup of the child? I and mean, some of them are just... So there, there are several things that can happen. One is that they can have a rupture around touch not feeling safe, right? 
it can also be conditioning. It might also be some kind of organization in the brain if there's autism and that kind of thing, where touch feels very uncomfortable. It's like a sensory overload sort right. of thing. But I think for the majority of the population, it has more to do with conditioning and ruptures and uh, negative experiences where touch is not wanted. And, and that doesn't even have to be real abuse situations, but just, yeah, I think there was a question here. No, I changed my mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one child who loves to be touched constantly and one who cannot stand it. Mm -hmm. And they both have similar everything kind of going on. Grew up in the same house. And, <laughs> and, yeah. They're both premature. One was the one who hates to be touched is the one who was slightly more premature. Mm -hmm. so. And sometimes that can be helped with some kinds of occupational therapies. She just, no, she's completely fine. She just has decided she doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. And that could be fine. Yes. I grew up in a very abusive family where uh, positive touch was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. And um, I married a man who was very huggy. And so it, it would encourage me is that you can actually, that can be changed. Mm -hmm. It can be changed. Yeah. Which is, you know. That's the hope. Yeah. And it can yeah. also be very problematic in couples where one person is really wants to be touchy and huggy and the other person is like, <laughs> so, yeah. I was just going to say that um, for me, and I think for some of the children I've worked with in the past, it's like when you're so stressed, you're beyond that, um, uh, you know, how much you can take. And that's when it's like being touched is you're just right on the edge. You know, it's just like um, right on the edge, you touch me. Even if it's to hug me or something like that, when my kids were little, I just have to say, okay, stand back three feet, three feet, because <laughs> just like, it's a sensory overload. I already have issues with sensory, you know, tags in my shirt and stuff like that. But then it's like, you know, no more as well. Because it's like fight or flight almost. Yeah, and you're going to slug somebody and yeah. they try to touch you. Yeah. Right, right. So that's that. how much receptivity is there in a given moment for that kind of containment and, and sometimes like we have to it's are we are we patting and hugging for ourselves or for them mm -hmm. so it's like as they get older especially checking in with them what can I do you want me to just sit here do you want to be alone yeah. and um, I'm wondering if there are any other kinds of questions that have come up over the course of the material and I will say that if you would like a copy of the presentations things that you missed um, you can give us your email up here. And Thank you so much for coming. Yes. I really appreciate you? all the engagement. Hi, I'm Hi. 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 Hi.